Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Bob Nowak is a professor of plant physiological ecology at the University of Nevada, Reno. He earned his master's degree and his PhD here at Utah State studying under Dr. Martin Caldwell. Uh, after a postdoc with Jay Anderson at Idaho State, uh, he joined the faculty at University of Nevada, Reno in 1985. He has over 30 years experience uh, in arid ecosystems, including the Great Basin and the Mojave Desert, and he was studying uh, ecohydrology long before ecohydrology was a phrase that was commonly used among scientists and managers. Uh, currently, his research emphasis focuses on examining uh, global environmental change and the management of invasive species. With that, please welcome Dr. Nowak. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm like probably most of you. I I would rather have been listening to Don Grayson right now, but um, it's it's sad that uh, he had his family had the health problems. But hopefully they'll all clear out and uh, he'll be back in shape and perhaps be back next year and uh, uh, present the same talk that he wanted to today. What I'd like to do is talk about uh, some of the. Uh, work that I've been involved with and, and others have been uh, doing on this thing called ecohydrology. Well, what, what's ecohydrology? <laughs> ecohydrology, it has many definitions. People have uh, come up with very elaborate and lengthy definitions, uh, but I'm kind of a simple guy, so I like simple definitions. And, and it really, most of the definitions really come down to this concept that ecohydrology is the interactions between the hydrologic cycle and ecosystems. And it's a, a fairly new discipline. Uh, various people have uh, said it, it started anywhere from 10 to 15 years ago, but really since about the mid-1990s, uh, the, the term had been, has been widely used and, and pretty well recognized. So we can give it about 15 years for uh, the sub-discipline. The, the difference between hydrology and this difference between ecology and ecohydrology is that really what uh, ecohydrology does, it, in, it includes the two-way interactions, the interactions between how the hydrologic cycle affects the ecosystem, ecosystem structure, ecosystem function, and vice versa, how ecosystem structure and function affect the hydrologic cycle. So it's a two-way street. So, uh, and that's, that's how ecohydrology is really different than just ecology or different than just hydrology. And part of the you know, arguments about is ecohydrology really new is that, well, there's ecologists that say, well, I was always doing ecohydrology. And there's hydrologists that were saying, well, I was always doing ecohydrology. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a, um, one of these disciplines that just evolved because people were doing it and finally recognized that we have something new and different here. The, the thing about ecohydrology that, uh, ecohydrology that um, it's, it's really interesting is that uh, modeling is really a big component of ecohydrology. And my head spins every time I look at some of the ecohydrology textbooks. I mean, there's equations and uh, formulas and, and derivations and integrations and differenti differential equations, things that, that really are not good, conducive to good talk. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm not... I don't know very many people that could give good talks, period, and I haven't heard very many good, very, many very good modeling talks. So uh, I, like I say, I'm a simple guy, so I'm going to try to stay away from modeling so you don't have to worry about that aspect of it. And what I'd like to do today is uh, do, uh, give a quick, um, some quick ideas about how the hydrologic cycle affects Plants. I'm, a, I'm interested in plants, so how it affects plants. And this is things you probably all know, so I'm going to go through that pretty rapidly. And then secondly, what I'd like to do is talk about sort of the flip side, how vegetation can actually affect the hydrologic cycle. And that might be something that not, uh, we're not as quite as familiar with, so I'll spend a little bit more time there. And then third, what I'd like to do is uh, ask the question, are there some you know, basic... Um, fundamental concepts that seem to be uh, true for the Great Basin. And uh, so we'll go, go through a few of those sort of things. And then at the end, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the implications 
of ecohydrology for um, different uh, aspects of things that we might be interested in. And there I'm mostly interested in soil water, uh, excuse me, in groundwater recharge and in uh, what might be occurring in uh, future environmental changes. So that's what's on tap for the next, uh, actually I like that 45 minute part. <laughs> made, actually made my job easier yesterday when I was uh, finishing putting the talk together. I, you know, I had all these slides and thoughts and well what am I going to do? I got to cut this down a half hour and then Darren called and said well you got to reprieve, I, you've got 45 minutes. So. Um, so first of all, what's the effects of the hydrologic cycle on vegetation? And a lot of you probably are very familiar with these types of uh, graphs that show different vegetation types in, in uh, North America. Um, and when you think about it, many of these uh, types of vegetation are really driven by uh, precipitation and precipitation and evaporation. For example, you can look at the first split here between the major vegetation types in North America, and that's really based on is the amount of precipitation greater than or less than the amount of evapotranspiration that might occur. And if you, if you have high amounts of precipitation relative to evapotranspiration, you're going to basically get either forest or a tundra type of vegetation if it's low precipitation, much lower than that for evaporation, you're going to get grassland or desert type of vegetation. Of course, you all know this sort of thing. And these precipitation patterns matter for the split between grasslands and deserts, and also the length of the drought in the summertime affect what kind of forest you get, whether a deciduous or conifer type of forest. Again, I think everyone's familiar with these. If we look at a more of a regional scale, especially in our, uh, uh, from the mountaintops to the valleys, the theme of the conference, uh, as you go up in elevation, obviously you get changes in vegetation. Here, this is for central Rocky Mountains along the front range of Colorado, and obviously when you get out on the plains, you have grasslands, and as you go up the mountaintops, you get different types of conifer forests. If you move across, these, these graphs are set up nicely so that if you move a, across a moisture gradient from a wet area to a, a more drier area, again, you get those changes in vegetation because of the changes in, in the hydrolog hydrologic cycle. And on a very local scale, you, know, you can very quickly and easily get changes in riparian areas versus the upland areas. And so we see this sort of thing. We know that the water cycle, that hydrologic cycle, affects vegetation, affects the structure, affects the function of ecosystems. I, we all know this very well, so I don't have to belabor this. But what about, um, it's not only the amount, but sometimes too, what's important is the timing of the precipitation. If you look at uh, 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 Kiona Ogle and Jim Reynolds compiled many, many uh, data from across around the world, and basically if you have more summer precip, if you're in anywhere from 250 or above uh, millimeters of summer precipitation, you're going to tend to get grassland type of vegetation less than about 250 millimeters of uh, summer precipitation. You get uh, more of shrublands, more of the sage brush steppe type of vegetation. So effects of uh, of uh, the hydrology on plants, obviously, it affects dis distribution of plants at multiple scales, from large scale, continental scales, down to local scales. Total amount of precipitation is important, but I think oftentimes we forget that it's not only just the amount of precipitation, but that, that balance between precipitation and potential evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration. And also timing of precipitation is, is very important. They all impact what kind of vegetation you're gonna get. The thing we don't oftentimes, though, think of is how vegetation can affect the hydrologic cycle. And, and one way is that plants can actually redistribute water within the ecosystem. And normally what happens during the day, plants are transpiring, so they're taking water out of the soil, it goes out through the plant, and it goes out to the atmosphere. That's the typical sort of process that you see occurring within, uh, within plants. But um, you know, what, what do plants do? Do plants have a secret life at night? And indeed they do. Uh, what happens at nighttime is that plants are still taking water out of the soil, but transpiration is basically dropped to very, very low amounts, and that water is now going out of the roots and being redeposited in the soil. And it's being redeposited if you have wet soils down uh, deeper in the soil, dry soils 
uh, nor towards the top of the soil profile. That water is taken out by the roots and the deep part, taken and they travel through the root system, and in those shallow soils, you get that water being redeposited back into the soil. And this process is called, well, it used to be called hydraulic lift. That was the initial kind of term to, uh, coined in that you lifted water from deep soils and deposited it up in uh, shallow soils. Uh, but since then, we've, we've come to the name called hydraulic redistribution. Basically, water is being re redistributed within the system. And one way that we, we've uh, seen this occur is what people do is they'll measure soil water potential uh, through time. Here's a, a series of uh, uh, measurements made over a series of days. This uh, hashed area would be nighttime. The clear area is, of course, daytime. And what you can see is during the nighttime, the soil water potential increases. If the soils are becoming increasingly wet over the night, and then the soils dry out the next day become wet that night, dry out during the day, wet up again at night. And if what, what a lot of times what people will do, they'll, they'll re try to reverse the cycle to try to uh, put sh artificial shading in, put artificial lighting in, artificial shading in, to see if they can uh, disrupt the cycle. And you can see you can, uh, the, that cycle of up and down has been dampened out, it's been changed a little bit. And then when you re-expose the plant to the normal daylight, you get reinitiation of that uh, diurnal cycle of wetting the soil at night, drying out during the day. Um, and and this, this is, happens to be some data from the Mojave Desert, uh, Ambrosia, a shrub species. And when you look at many different species, here's again, this, this is, happens to be the species from the Mojave Desert. We see it in many, many, many species. Uh, uh, you see the same pattern occurring that there's hydraulic redistribution occurring in, across uh, many different plants, across many different types of ecosystems. You see that in the Great Basin, you see it in Mojave Desert, you see it in grasslands, you see it even in more mesic types of environments in, uh, in the eastern part of the U.S. whenever there's a drier part uh, period. One interesting thing um, that's occurring here, Yucca shadigera is a cam plant, and uh, CAM plants basically have a reverse in their photosynthesis. They, most plants photosynthesize during the day. CAM plants take in their carbon dioxide at night. And so what you see in Yucca shadidra, remember, here at night, water, it, the water, soils are getting wet, wetter. Well, in Yucca shadidra, since their stomates are open, they're transpiring, they're taking in carbon dioxide at night. Uh, in this case, they're actually drying out the soils at night and then the soils get wetter during the day. And so you, you see this pattern occurring again over many, many different species, and you see it even in these cam plants, you see the reversed sort of process occurring. Well, uh, what are the implications then of this sort of hydraulic redistribution in, in the hydrologic cycle? Well, one thing is that typically what happens when it rains, if you have saturated soils at the top, then if all slowly that water will, will move down. You'll have that wetting front move down within the soil profile. And you also can get unsaturated flow that it basically works its way down through the soil profile. But this is, you know, the wetting fronts can move fairly rapidly, but they can only move so far. They can only move as far as the soils get saturated. Then after that, the unsaturated processes take over, and those are very, very slow processes. They take a long time to move water over any sort of appreciable distance. Well, with hydraulic redistribution, these root systems now are a conduit. It's a way to move water rapidly between different soil layers. Essentially, you can bypass this sequential movement of water down from the first soil layer to the second soil layer to the third, instead of sequentially moving it down, what hydraulic redistribution can do is can take water from these uh, shallow soils and move it directly to anywhere within the soil uh, profile. So you can have rapid movement of water amongst the different depth increments. You can see that occurring here uh, very clearly at this top panel up here is showing soil water potentials, again, along the y-axis over a series of days here. And this is an unvegetated plot, so there's no uh, uh, plants on there. And measurements were taken at different depths. You can see at 0.3 meters, 0.5 meters, on down to a 3 meter uh, deep within the soil. And 
what you can see, soil water potential hardly varies from day to day and, and amongst days uh, through time, even when you have these rainfall events. These are uh, different types of, uh, this is about a five centimeter, uh, excuse me, five millimeter, uh, 15 millimeter, and about 12 millimeter events that occur uh, on different days through this time series. And even at 30 centimeters, 0.3 meters deep within the soil, just, just, just about a foot down within the soil, these precipitation events were never really ever recorded at those depths. Yet when we have an area here that has Artemisia tridentata in there, sagebrush in there, um, you can see the gradual decline in soil water potential through, uh, that's occurring, and that's to be expected. This plant's growing, it's taking water out of the soil, so indeed the soils become drier and drier as time goes on. But when you have this five millimeter event occurring here, what you see is um, at, for example, here at 0.6 meters, you see a little blip here at 0.6 meters. Uh, here, where's, where's 0.3? At 0.9 uh, um, meters deep, you see again, these blips are occurring. So water, that water that wasn't even recorded at 0.3 meters uh, deep uh, on the unvegetated plot, here with Artemisia trinitata, you see it occurring down to about 0.9 meters. This 15 millimeter precipitation event got down to, water was detected down to 1.2 meters. So nothing occurring at 0.3 meters in an unvegetated plot, but when you have plants there, you can get this rapid movement of water to depth. What else can plants do? Oh, well, let me, let me just back up and say a few more words about why this might be important, other reasons why this might be important. Obviously, what this does to the plants, by moving that water down deep within the soil, it, it basically works as a way to store water. So that water has moved down. You know, these, these precipitation events here, essentially we're still at the top part of the soil surface. If plants happen to have roots there, they can go ahead and use that water. But most of the time that water is shallow in the soil just is lost to evaporation. If, uh, plants aren't able to use it in transpiration and in their physiological processes. But in, when this water now gets moved down deep, when you have vegetation, then plants are able to tap into that hydraulically redistributed water and use it at a later point in time. They can use it the next day to help sustain their transpiration rate and essentially be able to maintain their ability to fix carbon, to photosynthesize for a little bit longer period of time than they could without it. So it helps conserve water. The other things that it might be important for is it might be uh, important for the, the water that Artemisia tried to tie to sage but hydraulically redistributes might become available then to other plants. So not only is the plant that doing the hydraulic redistribution uh, potentially benefiting, but other plants that are growing in the community uh, also potentially could be benefiting from that water. And third, um, as you all know, nutrient cycling, microbial activity is dependent on some moisture in the soil. So having some moisture moved around, providing moisture to uh, other soil microorganisms may help in nutrient cycling. So there's some potentially uh, beneficial ramifications of hydraulic redistribution for the ecosystem. Another way that uh, plants can affect uh, water is, is the patchy nature of vegetation and runoff and run on processes that occur in that sort of uh, patchy landscapes that are present in our, in, in our type of ecosystem in the Great Basin where you have a, an inner patch area and then a patch of vegetation and then a bare ground, almost bare ground area, patch of vegetation. And what happens in these sort of scenarios when you have precipitation occurring, you have runoff occurring in these bare areas, run on occurring where you have patches of vegetation. So run water precipitation come down, water runs off the bare areas and it's collected again into those vegetation patches. And this is some, happens to be some data from um, from results from Australia, but the same thing uh, principle and same thing sort of applying in the Great Basin. You have these uh, bare areas here where water doesn't get very deep, but when you start getting uh, vegetation occurring, you can now start getting water penetration uh, to much deeper soil depths. So you can get, again, that water that's running off is being collected in the vegetated area and being uh, stored in deep within the soil in these types of uh, scenarios. And this is occurring throughout uh, all parts of the Great Basin into the pinyon juniper zones. It's been well demonstrated in, in PJs. 
there's, a, of course, as water is running off these um, bare spots, it's not only, water's not only moving, but also nutrients and sediment is also moving in, in these sort of scenarios. And again, being collected and concentrated in the uh, vegetation patches. And of course, these greater resources then in these patches are beneficial to plants. It increases their water status. People have demonstrated this. Um, and helps to sustain evapotranspiration, sustain the ability of plants to grow on these uh, isolated patches. It also helps, in, again, increase the wet the soils in those areas and increases soil microbial activity and, and then hence changes and increases nutrient cycling, makes more nutrients available uh, to the vegetation. On a larger landscape, um, the, this, you know, other factors can affect uh, these processes, disturbance and steep uh, slope steepness can affect what's oftentimes called the connect connectivity of the landscape. Basically, how uh, the runoff, run-on, runoff collection processes are occurring in a you know relatively um, flat site where you don't have too steep of a gradient, and you have good vegetation stands. You have the uh, um, runoff occurring, being collected by vegetation plant, plants, and you have basically essentially a conserving type of a landscape. The, uh, anything that does make, make it off site is usually pretty small in amount as far as water and as far as uh, nutrients and sediments. If you have a disturbance, for example, disturbance in upslope in an area, um, fire for example takes out most of the vegetation, uh, then what it, it changes the system somewhat. So you have greater amounts of runoff occurring, but if you have a good band of uh, uh, vegetation below that, then that can help to uh, catch a lot of that, uh, that sediment, a lot of that water, and uh, help conserve it, keeping it within the system. So it's lost in one part and rapidly moved to another part. Uh, if you get to very steep slopes, then how, even if you have good vegetation stands, at some point you overcome the ability of that system to uh, conserve and keep all that uh, erosion and sediment loss from, a, uh, from occurring. So with, with highly steep slopes, especially when you have any kind of disturbance occurring, any kind of uh, loss in vegetation, you're going to have more erosion and more loss of those uh, nutrients. The, the, the system, the veg vegetation pat patches are no longer able to uh, keep uh, and catch all that water and erosion, and you now have long connected patches of bare areas for erosion and sediment loss to occur. So what some of the ways then plants can uh, affect the hydrologic cycle, plants again provide conduits to map rapidly move water uh, around within the soil, Plant cover, the ve those vegetation plant patches, is a way to influence runoff and run on processes, at, especially at localized scales, and then these can build up to a larger scale across the landscape, obviously leading to redistribution of precipitation and soil, wa uh, soil resources among microsites, concentrating them in where there's vegetation and taking it out from areas that lack vegetation. And Obviously, this then can scale up to other processes that occur, competitive relationships amongst uh, plants, and uh, nutrient cycling. So the third part I'd like to talk about is, are there some sort of general eco-hydrologic eco patterns that occur within uh, arid environments? And one thing that seems to be occurring uh, very commonly in arid environments relates to plant water use. This is sort of, again, a schematic diagram of what's happening. You have precipitation coming in, plants are transpiring it out, and there's a potential, of course, for deep drainage to occur. At the top, about uh, 20 centimeters, a top foot of, of soil, evaporation can occur from that, and, but there's very little evaporation that seems to occur from soils deeper than that. So essentially, if you want to remove water from deeper in the soil, you ha basically have to have plants in there. And, and plants, of course, take it out from those shallow soils, but they can also take it out from deeper portions of the soil profile. When we start looking at uh, what happens uh, with plants in a on an annual basis, this is some data from a crested wheatgrass stand. The stand was planted actually in the fall of 1983, and soils were fairly wet, uh, and this is in uh, March, uh, excuse me, April. And what these are showing are soil water content as a function of soil depth. 
through time. And usually what happens is these graphs have uh, spring to fall graphs occurring across that way. So again, you can see April, and then June, July, August, September. So the soil profile basically is wet in the top part of the soil profile, and then the plants are drying that out. The next year, 1985, uh, water only made it down to about 0.6 meters in this particular year. That's what it was like in April, and by the end of the growing season, by fall, all the water was gone. In 1986, same sort of thing. This year it made it down a little bit deeper, 0.8, almost a meter deep, water made it down. But again, the water was fully extracted out of the soil profile by the end of that growing season. And if we look at many, many different species, we see similar types of processes. And, and what seems to be occurring is that water that comes into precipitation, it just basically is going back out again in evapotranspiration. And there's essentially no deep drainage, no water leaving the system out the bottom. There's no uh, potential for uh, groundwater recharge occurring. We, in this particular experiment, uh, even irrig well, let's see, I should first of all back up, and so here's crested wheatgrass, the data that I just showed you, but this is looking at the total amount of water then used by crested wheatgrass, uh, basin wild rye, sagebrush, and steam bank, stream bank wheatgrass, and essentially this is showing what the precipitation was for that particular year, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, and essentially the vegetation in, again, these plots were established in 83, 84, but by within a year after they're established, they're basically using all the available water each and every year. Even irrigated, basically tried to give the plants the maximum amount of uh, water that, you could, that they would experience in this particular area. This data happens to be from uh, southern Idaho, southeastern Idaho. And even when you irrigate it, gave the plants a lot of water, they're basically able to extract out and dry out the soils, even under worst case precipitation scenarios. Data from the Mojave Desert, same sort of thing. This data is presented a slightly different way. This is showing precipitation and evapotranspiration, and there's essentially a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. And so if you measure precipitation on most sites, you can tell, I can tell you what evapotranspiration is going to be. It's going to be precipitation. It's basically all the water comes out. Again, different, different species. There are some exceptions, and one that um, is perhaps the most common exception is in systems that are dominated by annual species, annuals such as cheatgrass. Uh, this is a normal bunch grass community, again, spring soil water profile, fall water soil profile, this dashed line here is the minus 15 bar, um, basically the permanent wilting point for, uh, for plants, and through the growing season, basically the bunch grass community again dries out that soil, takes all the water out of the soil during that growing season. Cheat grass community, certainly it dries it out in the top portion of the soil profile and it's taking some water out deeper in the soil but not nearly as much as a um, bunch grass community. So there is, in, in, in some situations, for example, cheat grass and perhaps in, in some highly disturbed areas, overgrazed areas and areas that recently experienced a, a fire, it's quite possible that in those scenarios you're going to have some water left deeper in the soil profile, um, at least for some period of time. If the area stays in cheatgrass, this water will persist at depth. In areas that recover from that disturbance, grazing, or a wildfire, then through time you'll go back to the uh, a normal system where water is completely extracted. Another uh, phenomenon that occurs in uh, Great Basin ecosystems is that the peak in soil water occurs early in the spring. This is, uh, and it's a little bit hard to see here, but each of these peaks that are occurring are occurring in, and this is uh, in, um, in, uh, in Washington State, in uh, southeastern uh, Washington State, in the, at the edge of the Great Basin. Uh, all these peaks are occurring in uh, February, March, April. April, actually, uh, these all occurring in February, March. In other parts of the Great Basin, 
uh, and this would be data from the Snake River Plain, they are occurring slightly later in, into April. But as you all know, uh, peak growing season, peak biomass in the Great Basin is occurring much, much later. It occurs in May at the earliest and oftentimes June and July. And so essentially what's happening in, in the Great Basin is plants are really living off stored water. So, if, you know, in, in many ways what water is in the soil in February or March, in, uh, in at April at the latest, depends on you know, how cold it is, how much snow occurs, what sort of snowpack you get. Uh, further north you go, obviously, the snowpack occurs later and later. But that's, that's the amount of water that the vegetation has to work, work with. And it, all the growth is occurring after that water uh, peaks in soil moisture. So the other thing that w occurs here, too, is that these uh, soil moisture, the most amount of soil moisture that's occurring is occurring early when the soils are cold and microbial activity is constrained then by those cold soil temperatures even though that's when maximum moisture is occurring. So nutrient cycling, uh, soil microbial activity, all of those activities are constrained because of the fact that they have cold soils and wet soils occurring simultaneously when it's warm, when the soils are warm, they're oftentimes dry. A third factor that seems to be occurring throughout uh, arid ecosystems, ecosystems, especially in the Great Basin, is the, this, this, this difference between uh, rooting depths and water infiltration. This is data that was compiled across all uh, arid systems around the world, so it includes, includes the Great Basin, but other types of systems. The Great Basin fits in it pretty well. And this data is showing for different types of plants, trees, shrubs, semi-shrubs, for different types of plants, it's showing uh, the, well, well, we'll talk about the uh, um, geometric mean, which is where half are above, half are below. So essentially half the plants have um, a rooting depth, half of the trees have a rooting depth of a little over three meters deep. For shrubs in, in arid ecosystems, it's a little over two meters deep. So half the shrubs have uh, roots down to uh, two meters. And you can see these maximum depths for species are occurring in the 20 meter range. And this occurs, uh, you know, if you look at just Great Basin species, you see similar types of patterns. Uh, we don't have any that, well, actually we have some that maybe are going down to this. Uh, uh, some of the uh, phreatophytic species would be going down into the 20 meters, but most of the sagebrush step type of species are at least growing down in, in uh, several meters uh, deep. Whereas annuals are much more shallowly rooted. But when we start looking at how deep is water penetrating in the soil, again this is this data from uh, the Snake River Plain, we're typically seeing soil recharge occurring to about 0.6 to anywhere from 1 to 1.2 meters. Okay, so we have recharge occurring here in that depth. This is some data from the Mojave Desert. Uh, this is data taken over a several year time interval. The way this is, is set up is this is soil water content through time at for different depth increments. Here's 0.2 meters, so it, it, it uh, started out pretty wet and you can see there's not a lot of change in soil water even at 0.2 meters, 0.4, 0.6, 0 0.8. But we see a few blips on an annual basis occurring at 0.6 meters. We hardly ever see any changes in soil water at 0.8. Here's a little bit one with some wetter periods here in 2004. And then there was this huge rain event at the, uh, in the fall of 2004. You can see that occurring right in here at, at uh, higher depths. And eventually it does make it down to almost 1.8 meters. So, you know, in many, in many of our uh, drier types of ecosystems, soil water recharge is never occurring much deeper than about that 0.6 to 1.2 meters, a few feet deep. Yet we have plants that are growing uh, roots down way in excess, oftentimes way in excess of that sort of scenario. Uh, it's a conundrum. Um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't really have any good uh, data to say why this is occurring. Some of it might be related to uh, hydraulic redistribution, growing roots deep. It allows the roots to grow deep, 
and it then also provides the benefit to store, increase in the storage capacity. It might be that uh, there's these occasional uh, large events that wet the soil down and plants might be just going after those occasional events. It's hard to say for sure what's actually driving it and perhaps and probably it's all of those involved. So what does this mean? What are some of the implications? And I've sort of alluded to it that watershed recharge within our arid ecosystems is very limited. It's only going to occur in certain types of situations in higher elevations where precipitation in forested areas where precipitation does in, uh, exceed uh, potentially evapotranspiration, where you can get runoff directly into so any sort of a channel, so where water is running off in those bare so soil spots and directly into a channel, then you're going to get uh, the potential for groundwater uh, recharge where large events occur, so whenever you have a large event, anywhere you have low infiltration, then you have potential. Shallow soils, obviously if you can't store the water, if there's more water that comes down that can be stored uh, in that snow melt event, in those uh, uh, early, uh, late fall, uh, early spring events, if you exceed the storage capacity, then you're gonna get runoff. And as I was indicated earlier, disturbed landscapes, cheatgrass infested sites, burned areas, heavily grazed areas. What about global environmental change? What are the potential impacts uh, uh, of global environmental changes on the hydrologic cycle? Well, in, in a future high uh, elevated CO2 world, kind of the idea is that as you increase uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, there's two ways that plants almost always respond to that. They increase their photosynthetic rates and they decrease their transpiration rates. And this is occurring at a individual leaf level and if you scale that to a whole plant, then you'd expect increased growth occurring because of the increased photosynthesis. And at a whole plant level, you'd expect decreased water use because of decreased transpiration rates. And then if you look at the ecosystem, obviously increased growth increased, leads to increased production. Decreased water use leads to increases amount of water in the soil. And indeed, we see this occurring. This is some data from a loblolly pine forest in uh, the southeastern U.S. And uh, these, uh, these open symbols, uh, this is uh, soil water uh, potential, so it's how, uh, how much water is in the soil as a function of soil water, water potential. And here are data from, um, um, and this, this is data from, from an uh, ambient CO2 plot. The fill circles are data from a elevated CO2 plot. So the soils are wetter under elevated CO2, just as it was predicted by this sort of model. Data from a Swiss grassland under, again, another elevated CO2 um, experiment. And probably the easiest way to look here is to look at the difference in soil water content. And in most cases under elevated CO2, you have more water in the soil under elevated CO2. So water certainly is being conserved and there's more water available under elevated CO2. But if you look in uh, arid types of ecosystems, we see a different type of scenario occurring. This is data for an elevated CO2 plots, ambient CO2 plots, and plots that didn't have any of the uh, uh, structures to do the experiment. And it's really hard to see the difference in here. And, and that's the point, is you can't see it. You cannot see the difference. Essentially, under elevated CO2 conditions, you don't have any uh, difference in soil water content between elevated and ambient CO2. And so you don't have this conservation of water that's occurring in arid types of systems. Well, why is that? Well, increased growth can increase the amount of tissues that are respiring, which of course then increases water use. And at least in arid systems, these C2 uh, factors, the increased growth leading to increased water use, but elevated CO2 leading to d decreased water use on an individual leaf basis tend to balance each other out and you get no change in soil water content, no change in ecosystem use under elevated CO2. Um, let's see, I think I'm getting pretty close to the end here. So I, got, I, guess, I guess I didn't have any problems at all getting 45 minutes worth <laughs> of material here. Uh, I'm going to skip this one and I just want to end with talking about altered precipitation events and uh, this is an experiment that was done um, in uh, southeastern Oregon essentially where they uh, looked at um, control plots were basically where plots were outside of the rainout shelters and they had rainout shelters that basically got the same amount of water that we currently get 
then they shifted precipitation to predominantly spring or predominantly winter types of uh, uh, events. And what can occur, this change, again, changing the timing of when precipitation is occurring can affect the vegetation. And in this case, these arrows here are just marking uh, the spring, <coughs> spring treatment. So these are plants, these are communities that are getting increased amounts of uh, precipitation in the spring. And what it's doing is it's, these are all, it's poa semburiga, total herbaceous, perennial grasses, perennial forbs. What it's doing is it's decreasing the amount of herbaceous productivity that's occurring in the Great Basin. So to summarize then what some of the effects on global environmental changes are, uh, global changes, especially increased uh, uh, atmospheric CO2, and even ultra precipitations are unlikely to actually affect water yield or to affect uh, the amount of water that's available from arid landscapes. There might be changes in timing leading to affecting the growth of plants um, that's occurring. Oops, let's see. Yeah, un, uh, the, the slide I skipped over basically was saying that uh, increased summer precipitation in, in arid environments probably is not going to persist long enough to uh, benefit spring growth of plants. And then this last slide that we looked at showing that increased spring precipitation decreases herbaceous species. So with that, um, that's all the uh, information that I wanted to present. And uh, if we have, do we have a minute, a minute or two for questions? Okay. The, the question was, uh, does it matter what type of uh, root system the plants have, whether it's a, a more tiny branch diffuse root system versus one that has a, uh, a tap root? Well, the, the more diffuse the root system is, the it's a, like I say, it's a, it's a passive process, and it, it just moves through the, um, the system. The smaller the structures are, of course, the, the less water physically they can move. Uh, but that doesn't mean that a big tap root can move a lot more. That's going to is going to move a lot more. It's going to move it, but it's going to move it into a more constrained area. Whereas a diffuse root system is going to move it down to uh, uh, more different areas. Tap root, if it goes deep enough, is going to be able to move it to a deeper extent than you know uh, um, a shallow, highly branch system. Uh, you got juniper. That's massive in the Great Basin. What kind of root system does it have? Is it and what, what impact does it have on soil water? Well, um, it, it, the junipers are sort of at the, this boundary between where you're starting to get this uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration becoming more or less equal. In at the lower end of the, uh, the, the pinion juniper uh, zone, probably in those sort of scenarios, you're going to have uh, precipitation more than <laughs> evapotranspiration. So those systems will utilize all the water that's available. And even, you know, I think, as you go up higher in elevations and, and get to where uh, they're about equal, or maybe even uh, precipitation exceeding uh, uh, evapotranspiration, then I still think you're gonna, they're going to be pulling up most of the water. Junipers have, um, tend to have roots that go down deep and then go out laterally. And, and, and they're not unusual for many of our shrub species in, in lower elevation. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the rule of thumb often is that, you know, roots go out to the drip line of the plant. Well, um, that's wrong for almost all of our uh, plants. Uh, even some of the herbaceous species are going out well past the drip line. Shrub, woody species, uh, it's not unusual to have them going out uh, five to ten times past their, uh, their, their drip line. So if it's um, you know a, a canopy of, of a half meter in diameter, you can easily have uh, roots that are going out uh, on the order of three to five meters, very much, much further. Uh, Juniper same sort of thing. It, it has its roots going out laterally, it has its roots going down. Of course, once they hit bedrock, it starts to constrain depth of growth. So that, you know that, that's that's always a constraint on. Uh, I think it's fractured up to keep it going. Down. Uh, and I don't know what the maximum depth is for junipers. Um, I just don't know what that value is off the top of my head. Uh, I suspect it could go down easily into the, the multi 
the extent at which water is redistributed, uh, uh, there's no try to, there's no easy number there. It's not a fixed, you know, one meter value. It, it's really the size of the root system. Uh, you know, it'll go up and down depending on on the depth of the root system. It'll go out laterally, back and forth depending on how uh, extensive the root system is. I should point out too that there are ways plants can well can sort of uh, modulate it. If you know, to have this phenomenon occurring, you have to have good contact between the roots and the soil. And, and as the roots uh, dry out, they tend to shrink, and so you, you can get a disruption of that process eventually. From that, or you know, root hairs are also good for maintaining root soil contact. So if the you know the the roots are old enough, they've lost the root hairs, you can start to lose that same sort of phenomenon. 